A very good evening at Hyde Park tonight. We will talk about how Malaysia, a nation that has transformed itself uh, with policies that were continued regardless of government change. And to talk about this, I have uh, invited to our studios at Hyde Park a gentleman who has spearheaded economic transformation between 2010 and 2018, a former speaker of uh, Malaysia between 2013 and 2015. He was also the former member of parliament, a former member of parliament of Malaysia between 2004 and 2013. And the gentleman has also been a senator from the year 2015 and 2018. He is the initiator of government economic transformation programs for Malaysia, which were initiated in 2010, going on until year 2018. But of course, these policies look at a vision 2020 this year. Dr. S.K. Devamani, a very warm welcome to Hyde Park. It's indeed a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Indivari. And I'm very, very happy to be here. Indeed. And thank you for giving this opportunity to Hyde Park. It's a very popular channel. It's and indeed. let's share some, some good things, uh, positive things, because too many wrong things are actually hovering around us now. Hope that today's discussion can be very beneficial to your nation and also my nation. Certainly, we really look forward to talking positive aspects about how we go forward, what lessons we can uh, learn from Malaysia and what we can take to Malaysia from here uh, in Sri Lanka. You're visiting here. This is not your first time in Sri Lanka. Yes, yes, Let's yes. talk a little about uh, what you see in Sri Lanka since uh, your first visit and uh, you were here during the Commonwealth meetings and uh, also uh, you're visiting Sri Lanka now. Let's start off there. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, when I came uh, more than a decade ago, of course, I saw a different Sri Lanka, a different Colombo. And when I come uh, again now uh, for, a, for actually an international conference for on uh, uh, psych so socio-psychological health, mm -hmm. we presented papers in the National Institute of Education. Uh, and uh, we, I, I realized that Sri Lanka is a different Sri Lanka. One definite thing I can tell you is Colombo is so clean and so green. <laughs> Certainly. And that's what we are looking for. Green and clean. Green, the clean, entire beautiful. whole world is crying out mm -hmm. to be clean and to be green. And I think uh, you have this beautiful country which is so green and so natural, which is so beautiful. And I see that uh, there's a discipline uh, aura, aura everywhere. Discipline aura. And I think that's going to be uh, very, very uh, useful for your country, definitely to move forward, no? And uh, the Colombo transformation, uh, I, as I said, is, uh, it's going to be beautiful. And you still kept all the parks, the fields. I see the rugby fields, I see the football fields, I see the cricket fields. And in our part of the country, we have lost it a bit. Mm -hmm. And I hope and pray that the heritage is well preserved. Thank you so much for keeping that intact. I went to Gaul uh, day four yesterday and I saw the beaches are so clean. And I saw the heritage buildings are so well kept, preserved. And your tourism is going to come back again uh, very big, believe me. And you're now uh, poised to grow. And I'm so happy to be, uh, to be here to witness that a little bit. Certainly. Uh, you have a lot of um, positivity about the, the, the journey Sri Lanka can, can take, where our policies will take us and what our actions will take us forward in the region and the rest of the world. But let me uh, look at Malaysia now. Uh, Dr. Mahathir Mohamed, an inspirational leader who transformed Malaysia. But of course, you were uh, deputy um, minister for the former prime minister's office in Malaysia. This was during uh, the period uh, that Dr. Mahathir Mohamed was not in office. But you still speak highly of uh, Dr. Mahathir Mohamed, who at uh, age 56 um, became prime minister uh, <laughs> yeah, initially 1981. 1981 and continued until year 2003, Three. a long spanning um, uh, tenor as prime minister. And, and then again, he returns to office in 2018 at age 93. Now, this was something <laughs> the entire world was looking at. Exactly. What's it like? I am definitely proud of him. Uh, when I, my generation of people grew with his policies. Mm -hmm. uh, 81, I was just a young teacher. Uh, and we saw him transform the nation 
we are very proud of him for his intellectualism and his courage. He took on the entire world IMF, International Monetary Fund in, uh, during the uh, global crisis in 1998, mm -hmm. and when he packed the dollar, Malaysian ringgit against the dollar, which is very daring. So this man has got guts, and he's brought the country to a different level. Uh, but and it's very rare that an opposition uh, <laughs> minister will sp speak so highly uh, about a prime minister no, from a different. Uh, I was with this, uh, with his party all the while. He was the ruling party of my our coalition mm -hmm. for the last uh, twenty, when the twenty-one years as a prime minister at that time, twenty-three years. Mm -hmm. Only now he's got on a different <laughs> shirt, <laughs> and the spirit is still the same. Right. Uh, and right. the transition was very smooth. Mm -hmm. We just handed over to him. He, the majority was lost, and he, he took over. And the policies are his. Some of the mega policies that he has created are still his. Of course, the former prime minister, who is now under Najib some Razak. scrutiny, Najib Razak, has also followed up with him. He was his vice president he, when he was the president of the ruling Amno. Mm -hmm. So, if you ask me, there is definitely a continuity. When this uh, national cohesion loss in after 71 years. He took over, Tun Mahathir took over on a new platform. Mm -hmm. uh, it is still a continuity of that same policies. And you must be uh, informed that the policies were actually, uh, that both of them created, got the people involved. The problem with the uh, nations are, some of the leaders, they, they, they create programs and policies according to their own understanding. Whereas the global change is so dynamic, uh, I'll give you some example. Uh, recently, the Oxford uh, Economics and Cisco uh, survey in September 2018 says that 17 to 54% uh, of uh, uh, our workforce will be affected in the next 20 years because of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And 7.4% uh, of Malaysian workers will be displaced by 2028. And 48% uh, of the Malaysians will be very on a high risk platform because of uh, automation in the manufacturing sector, which is 80% of our national backbone economy. Mm -hmm. So looking at this, uh, we must be so dynamic in change. If you are not changing every year, every five years, every two and a half years, we, do, we have these plans intact, mm -hmm. where we have Vision 2020. Now we talked of Vision 2030. Tun Mahadev is talking about Vision 2030, which is, uh, we call it Shared Prosperity Vision. Mm -hmm. And then there was already talk from a former prime minister talking 2050, national transformation 2050 for the millennials. Mm -hmm. What will be a, a child who is now one year old, two year old, will be in 2050? What are the dynamics of change that's going to happen in the global, the Western world? And also in the, the China and India, which is going to be a global economic power. And how are we be prepared for that challenge? And Sri Lanka can embrace some of the ideas that we, we have come up with with the stakeholders. So what we did was, during my time, we brought everybody together. The corporate world, the governmental sector, the uh, secretary of ministries, the ministers, mm -hmm. even mid-rung officers right. who don't understand nationalism. They only understand their department, that narrow-minded Napoleon thinking, little Napoleon thinking. And then we brought private sector players, serious corporate people. And we scouted for some of the best brains. 136 of them throughout the world, Malaysians who have migrated and have gone into big organizations, Harvard, Cambridge, uh, and Oxford graduates. We brought them together and we set, set out for a year to plan the national's direction. What can we do? What are the sectors to focus on? What are the reforms we need to do? Mm -hmm. What are the regulatory framework uh, revolution that we have to make? Mm -hmm. What are the legislative reforms we have to do? What has to be passed in parliament? to cut the bureaucracy. 53 Commonwealth countries are still suffering from the bureaucratic hurdles which has now impeded the growth of, or the, has become a problem to the growth of any sector. Mm -hmm. And this mindset has to change. You know, people want to still work with the government. They're so complacent, easy. The salaries will be there, the pensions will come. And so the country decided that 92% of the national economy must be engineered by the private sector. 8% only by the government sector, and the government sector must become a facilitator, mm -hmm. not business itself. Right, right. So we must allow the business people to do the business, and they must be regulators and facilitators. 
the government be regulators and facilitators while the private sector runs the economy and be the real stakeholders yes. uh, and participants. We'll talk about Malaysia's experience and what Sri Lanka can draw from its uh, transformational journey so far after this break at Hyde Park. Welcome back. At Hyde Park tonight, we're talking to Dr. S.K. Devamani, a former Deputy Minister of the former Prime Minister's Office, a former Senator, former Speaker, former Member of Parliament and the Initiator of Government Economic Transformation Programs for Malaysia. Tell me a little about this. You initiated this program 2010 to 2018, and then you're looking at a Vision 2020. You spoke about how Malaysia looks at 2050 uh, for even a young child, how that child's future will be in 2050. But this is more or less a short-term program that you initiated to be the stepping stone um, for a mid to long-term program, I believe. Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the other reforms, uh -huh. the government has done many reforms, uh, to be frank with you. The governmental transformation, which uh, looked at the entire governmental uh, bureaucracy, how to reform. Uh, because uh, we had 1.3 million government servants uh -huh. in the government and the, even our present Prime Minister feels it's too big. Imagine uh, the, the, the coming of artificial intelligence and digitalization. Uh, in an office where there are 10 people, you only need two people. This, the system will work for itself. Uh -huh. So how are we going to prepare this uh, workforce for the future? And how do you reduce workforce? And uh, everybody wants to leave the government for security reasons. So that's one. And, uh, and of course, the, the young generation, what are the challenges? The latest uh, economy is gig economy. People don't work in office anymore. Grab doesn't own a car. Uh, and uh, look at uh, Tony Fernandez, the Air Asia guy. Uh, he doesn't earn from the passengers who pay. Mm -hmm. He's working on the digital database that comes to him, millions and how to use the, digi uh, the, the database to earn money on other consumables. So things are changing tremendously. The economy is changing. Uh, and of course, we have uh, the future will be so challenging to the young. TVET, no graduates are coming out jobless. They don't know what to do because everybody wants to go into the university, college. And the world is need, uh, will be in need of skilled workers. Mm -hmm and the different skills, new skills, uh, skills which are very, very specific, very focused. Uh, for example, uh, we, we look at uh, 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 Industrial Revolution 4, robotics, cryptocurrency, blockchain, artificial intelligence, internet of things, machine language. These are the future economy that's going to now be in any sector even with the agriculture sector. One of my friends is in Finland. He is a very close friend of mine, the university friend, who is now migrated there and working in Finland. He is in the agricultural department. Only four of them handle uh, acres and acres of agricultural uh, produce, mm -hmm. all done by robotics and machines. Mm. Imagine, fertigation, high-tech fertigation for fi in Finland. So it has gone to that level and it will catch up or to the growing world, the developing world, the third world. And we must prepare this, the child today for that thinking. Our education system has to be reformed. It's not road learning, not exam oriented. Uh, uh, answer this question, marking schemes are given and you, you give marks and the child gets to know. It's, it's going to be high order thinking skills, sol problem solving skills. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, beyond all these economic uh, needs of the child mm -hmm. of today. 20, uh, 2050 require the child to be strong, emotionally, mentally, mm -hmm. and physically. And this is going to be the greatest challenge. Today's children are talking about, uh, when you ask them, what do you want? I spoke to a colleague of yours just now. He said, uh, many of them want to become uh, YouTube heroes, mm -hmm. TikTok heroes, Instagram heroes, Twitter heroes. So this is not going to change the world. They are going to be so uh, hedonistic, pleasure-seeking. Same like how the American pub, uh, young are suffering today. The Western world is suffering. 
Uh, imagine 25 percent of American uh, between 15 to 20 uh, or 35 are actually uh, into psychosocial uh, substances, psycho substances, you know, illegal ones, because they are, they cannot manage themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, Sri Lanka has got that that power of religion, spirituality, that Buddhism and the Hinduism, the Christianity and the Islam has given. And you can work on these spiritual platforms mm -hmm. to give them the inner strength to take on all this because the future is going to be a strong personality who can take on pressure, who thinks beyond uh, examination, think out of the box and be prepared with the knowledge of skills. Malaysia's TVET, for example, next year we need 225,000 skilled workers okay. and we have to prepare the education system to prepare them. So even universities, some universities will be converted into technical education hubs. Community centers will be converted into technical uh, skill centers. You have to do this transformation. And if we are not prepared, we'll be again colonialized by the, by the Western world through a technology forum. Last time through a physical colonization, we had Portuguese here, we had the Dutch here, we had the English here in, in, in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. Eventually technology will take you all over. And you will always be a servant to the developed world. I'd like your expertise in asking you um, what policies we need to continue in Sri Lanka because Malaysia, we look at policy consistency, 1981 um, onwards we see policy consistency. Yes. This is amazing, you don't exactly. see this anywhere in the world and uh, longer serving uh, Prime Minister who returns to become Prime Minister in 2018. But again, Dr. Mahathir Mohamed, he sought to bridge Malaysia's ethnic gaps through general prosperity to the nation. In Sri Lanka, we did see a dark period of division, but still the country was united as one, uh, taking the country forward in terms of achieving economic development and widespread uh, reconciliation. Let's talk about um, how Malaysia overcame these ethnic divisions decades ago uh, to, to stand as one nation and what we can learn in Sri Lanka from all that. Of course we had our problems too because uh, it's something like Sri Lanka too. We had uh, the, the, the Malay population mm -hmm. we, who are actually uh, Muslims right? and we had the, the Chinese population who are basically Buddhist Christians. Then we had the Indians who are predominantly Hindus uh, and um, so we had also the, the Sabah, Sarawak, Kadazan, Dusun, Morun, Iban, different ethnicities. So uh, we had this concept called, I think in Sri Lanka you have two. We had this concept called Rukun Negara, like uh, Indonesia Panchasila, mm -hmm. the five codes of nationhood. Mm -hmm. That uh, you respect the king, you respect uh, the constitution, you respect law and order, you respect, you be a very uh, cultured person. Uh, and we are, we are law-abiding citizens. These are the fundamentals that kept everybody together. Mm -hmm. But of course, globalization has actually dented this process because the YouTube and uh, Googles and all that took over. But basically what was more importantly is there was a scheme in the 80s and 90s where Tun Mabe uh, had this concept where people can buy shares in, in government-linked companies. Mm. Uh, and he, the banks will borrow money to them to buy the shares. Even they are poor, they are uh, uh, below middle class groups who can afford. And they were also schemed by this former prime minister uh, where they give you a, a 5,000 ringgit mm -hmm. in Malaysia's ringgit, which is about maybe 2,000 US or 1.5 thousand US, where they, you can buy the shares. A dividend of 6 to 7% is given annually because these government linked companies invest in uh, procurements from that government and also others and uh, what preference is given to them. Mm. Profits given back to the citizens. So millions of people got involved in this. So there was a shared vision. And becoming real stakeholders. Stakeholders of the, of the nation. That means we have equity. Mm -hmm. Because why do people get angry? Because they don't have, uh, what, uh, they don't have an equity in the nation. They don't have land, they don't have house, they don't have uh, a share. They don't understand share market. The young people, the children understand. Daddy, mommy, you have a share. They, you teach them on passive income mechanisms. Not just go and be a wage earner, but eventually learn how to invest. Mm -hmm. 
on things that can bring you money, which was, of course, the, own, uh, the ownership of the elite groups. The whole globe is working on passive income mechanisms. You know, one uh, China-US war can, can kill the capital market, can destroy the capital market. One coronavirus can, can give so much impact to any economy. So these are things that they did. And I agree with you that uh, there was the right policy at the right time. Given the experience of 85 crisis, economic crisis, the 97 economic crisis, the 2005 economic crisis, and now 2020, another crisis due to all these happenings, mm -hmm. you know, this uh, US, China, and also the corona, all these have impacted, but we have experienced that too. So there are a few things that we, we didn't want to get the middle class to be caught in the trap or middle class trap. Mm -hmm. We have a problem of inflation, prices are going up. At the same time, you see wages are stagnated. Mm. You only have this amount of salary and the movement is very small. Right. And the economy is not really generating money to give more money, or be it be a government servant or the private sector. So how do you? So you increase productivity, reskill them, and then prepare them uh, for savings for the future generation because even uh, the middle class want to put them into private schools is going to be very costly uh -huh. so and everybody wants to have a car it's going to be costly but where do they get the money these are things that the government thought of and came out with concrete plans which is too many things again I don't have the time to tell certainly. you certainly certainly we'll take a short break before yeah. we come back to talk about uh, how you see Sri Lanka and where we can go um, in the next few years and of course 2050 let's look at 2050 exactly. for Sri Lanka just as Malaysia has a policy for 2050 <laughs> we'll come back after this short break Welcome back. You're joining us at Hyde Park. Uh, Dr. Devamani, um, we were talking about uh, amazing policies that Malaysia implemented to transform your economy. But in Sri Lanka too, we're looking at uh, uh, renewed prosperity. We're looking at uh, a, a longer term vision where we can position Sri Lanka as a hub, not just in South Asia, but in the entire region of Asia, just as much as all these superpowers are interested in this strategically located island nation. I'm sure you have observations of where we will be, how we can direct our policies in order to take us towards this vision. And I promise that we'll talk about 2050. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's yes. good. Let's think of the future. And I, I must tell you that uh, fundamentally what uh, Sri Lanka needs is stability, mm -hmm. political stability. So you need uh, leadership for a longer period of time to plan, to execute and also to uh, see the results. And that is very important. And uh, the, the, the people, for example, should be very careful with fake news. The fake news culture is moving in a very unprecedented speed. And this can decide the, the growth or, of, or the destruction of any leadership in country mm -hmm. that we can see in the US, we can see in UK, even in Canada, and in France, Macron used to be popular, he's no more Trudeau. Everybody is facing this challenge. Mm -hmm. And so much so that the leadership is becoming very short-term leadership. And that cannot bring change. Fundamentally, things which are right has to be supported. So the, the citizens has to be responsible. The civil society has to be responsible. The politicians has to be re responsible. So they have to be responsible towards uh, what is going to be done and whether fundamentally is correct. Uh, of course, tax exemption and all that uh, or reforms are important because it reduces the burden of the people. Mm -hmm. And people are very much instant uh, gratification seeking. So are you saying the stimulus package and uh, the tax reduction in Sri Lanka immediately after the uh, elections interest rate cut, that is a positive way forward while other experts are not very happy about it? No, it's positive. It's, it's reducing the burden of the, of, of, of the people. At the same time, keeping an election promise which is so important. What I say, I do. That will bring about some confidence in the people. And you must give space for a leadership to grow. Tun Mahade had 23 years before, and he's got another two more years now. And his uh, deputies took over from him, the, the last former two prime ministers, mm -hmm. who were after Mahade, were actually his people. He is the one who groomed them. So there was this continuity that allowed him to bring about the change. 
in the midst of all the turmoil of economic uh, crisis that took place. And these uh, policies were able to be implemented. And uh, what is uh, 2030? Let's start short first. Mm -hmm. 2020 to 2025. Right. Then 2020, uh, 2020 2030. Then 2050. Mm -hmm. And I think this uh, dev development plan will be helpful for the country. And you're, you're in the center. You are the pearl of the Orient. You were and you will become. And whoever is willing to help the country's growth must be given a hand. Even though there will be, uh, there will be uh, what protests, there will be uh, anti-Sri Lankan voice from some certain parties from the Western world. But if there are people who are willing to come and assist you, help you to grow, you must... First is infrastructure development. You've got to have massive infrastructure, infrastructure development. Ports, roads, railways, uh, in the city. The war is no more going to be between countries. Mm -hmm. The war is going to be between cities. Kuala Lumpur is going to challenge Manila. Manila is going to challenge uh, Bangkok. Bangkok is going to challenge Jakarta in terms of cosmopolitan culture. And that requires fantastic infrastructure, fantastic culture of the people who know how to use the toilets and, 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 and the roads properly. The culture, the civilization process, that will grow the people. And infrastructure is so important. And you have already have an agricultural hub. And your strength is organic agriculture, your spices. And I visited your cinnamon fac uh, a plantation yesterday, day for yesterday, and I was impressed. Organic. And the world is seeking organism, mm -hmm. uh, or organic uh, materials like this. So I think you are sitting on an agricultural revolution here, which the, because your earth is a God-given God uh, fertility, you know. Everything grows here. Green everywhere, I see. And you have got fantastic beaches. Imagine, you have wealth that can be shared. And of course, you are strategically located. The one pal road that eventually can bring uh, the, back to the centuries of, of businesses that you to grow. So you have to have your own identity, your own pathway. You cannot be disturbed by criticism from outside. You have to have your clear direction. And of course, you have a young uh, population. Young people are coming out from the university. Your population is young. Mm -hmm. So we given all that, I think. And I, I know that uh, Sri Lanka has got brains. Dr. Devamani, you speak about uh, Sri Lanka being strategically located, about, uh, about the One Belt, One Road mm -hmm. initiative, mm -hmm. uh, which most of our countries are a party to. Of course. And uh, Malaysia recently renegotiated a rail project with the Chinese government, avoiding uh, costs of 5.3 billion termination costs to be paid. But we're also talking about a lot of controversy surrounding who is involved in Sri Lanka. While you talk about uh, this war between cities, this vision to become greater, we're also juggling superpowers. Are we doing it right? And also we're talking about economic involvement. Port City Project, China's massive involvement, and then um, other superpowers feeling threatened. Economic diplomacy to political diplomacy. Yeah. Are we juggling it right? I, 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 saw, I read the recent UN uh, resolution mm -hmm. or this uh, US. I think uh, basically uh, people are getting jittery in the Western world. The, 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 the developed country are going to find India, China, and the Asian tigers growing. Uh, to become economic powers, and this is actually fear. So the, anybody who is close to China or, or these superpowers will become a threat to them. So there will be a lot of uh, this criticism coming, but you have to stand firm. Nationalism and the importance for Sri Lanka, the heartbeat of Sri Lanka can never be compromised. The way Malaysia took a stand. We work with anybody who is willing to work with us, to grow us together. They are not a political threat. They can give support for economic growth, which can allow modernization and job creation for the people. What is wrong? So what is the intent? Is it to, to give away your nationhood, your, your spirit of nationalism, or actually to grow your nation? If that heartbeat is correct, the sanctum sanctorium is right. How do we manage these international institutions? We talk about uh, the IMF, how Malaysia, even during a time of uh, world recession, a global uh, meltdown, we see how Malaysia handled these global financial institutions who would have otherwise 
had a strong say in uh, how the Malaysian economy would be run. In Sri Lanka too, we have we have the IMF telling us what to do, the World Bank telling us what to do. We're dependent on a stimulus package. How do we move out of this? What is the way forward? Tun Mahathir took on them and came out uh, pegging 380, pressuring it for per US dollar. At that time, IMF said, you're wrong. You're going to destroy your nation. But after that, Thailand, Philippines, Korea, Japan suffered. And they came back and after <laughs> one, two years, they came back and said, what you did was correct. Your fiscal policy was correct. So everybody has got their own method of solving their problem. Sri Lanka have to find its own way of solving problem. And uh, you know best what is best for you. Your, your, your socio-economic policies, your people's psyche, and how it works. And you have to come and find your own solutions for your problems. You cannot allow people to dictate. You can take their views, understand them, digest them, but the solution must be yours alone. So that is the future of Sri Lanka. On that note, let's take a short break and we'll return to talk with Dr. Devamani when we return at Hyde Park. Welcome back. Dr. Devamani, we've been talking about um, your uh, observations of Sri Lanka and what hope we have as a nation. But let's look, uh, look at our industries, our tourism industry. We talk about uh, Sri Lanka relying on the tourism industry, but in 2019, we did see that this industry too, uh, with, with, with a terrible attack in Sri Lanka, had a setback. Yes, we were resilient enough to come out and uh, recover um, but how do we look at sustainability here and how do we venture into other industries where when one industry gives us shocks, we move to the other and, and, and prosperity and growth continues mm. as it is? Well, uh, even in Malaysia, we had a problem of, uh, of relying on, on, on palm oil, mm -hmm. uh, palm oil uh, and also rubber right. and tin. Uh, very much uh, dependent on that uh, industry. Then, uh, of course, Tun Mahade and the former Prime Ministers decided to diversify. Imagine they took Petronas, the petroleum industry, out of Malaysia. Only 30% income for Petronas come from within Malaysia. 60% comes from the ventures outside with Shell, Mobil, uh, Caltex, or an exploration, uh, drilling somewhere else throughout the world. And uh, Sri Lanka is growing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just uh, 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 probably coming out of all this crisis that you had. You have to have industrial parks, modernize SMEs, small and medium enterprises, uh, in line with what's happening outside. And you, you, you have to now, how do you challenge prices from China? Because their, uh, their production uh, is so cheap. They can sell so cheaply. What are the niche markets that we can sell from Sri Lanka? You've got to look at it. Uh, what are your human resources good at? The population is good at what? Look at all this strength of Sri Lanka and create these niche markets. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and create parks and give them incentives for 10-year tax exemption, pioneer status, bring in people from overseas because Sri Lanka is now peaceful. Now you can bring investors into and it's strategically located and you have the land base. Once the infrastructure sets, uh, sets, sets in place with all these people, so bring investors into Sri Lanka. Your market is not only Sri Lanka, India is just beside. And you are towards Southeast Asia, and you are towards that side, Middle East. And imagine you are in the center. And with that, you can really, know, aquaculture, another uh, area that you can really modernize aquaculture. We have brought in people from Japan, Korea, and also Taiwan to modernize our aquaculture for fisheries. Uh, I see that much of the uh, fishering, fishery uh, industry is very much dependent on the old style of fishing. Mm -hmm. You can also do cultivate, uh, f uh, what, aquaculture. Right. I know prawns, there's so much demand. Given uh, China who will not be able to send because of this crisis, you can send over from here to the other part of Europe. 
which is very not, not too far away from here. So you've got to diversify your industries into areas of uh, food industry, uh, uh, the agriculture, you've got so much of other things. Maybe you can bring auto automation here, uh, here. You can bring automobile industry, I don't know. Uh, you've got to go and talk to people, go out there, have your mission, talking to a lot of people, giving concessions and tax exemptions here, and get your workforce into it, because you speak English. Your graduates speak to a certain level English, and that is a lingua franca of the, of the globe. And people will come in, go for disaster centers, uh, deeper inside Sri Lanka, where uh, the, some of your big tech companies uh, suddenly got caught because of these uh, chips in China. Apple is struggling, Google is struggling, Facebook is struggling, uh, and for iPhone is struggling because so much production in China. Mm -hmm. Until the, when the crisis came and the, uh, Donald Trump says uh, they want sanctions and they have problems. This is the time to go and, go and lobby, have lobbies everywhere. And you have Sri Lankans uh, residing everywhere throughout the world. You have globalized them now. Right. So that crisis now is for you to pick on and grow. That crisis today is for me a blessing. I like the way you look at uh, everything, a uh, fresh perspective. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Devamani, uh, the way Malaysia in, uh, invited and encouraged investments, foreign direct investments uh, into your country, is it something that we can study also reduce taxes, uh, encouraged um, investments through various incentives? Here in Sri Lanka, we're still, um, we are still struggling to live to the potential in terms of investments and how we lure these investments. What do we iron out here in order to do that? What do we learn from Malaysia? Exactly. Number one is to identify what you want to focus on. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, when during my uh, tenure in the uh, Prime Minister's Department, the Economic Planning Unit, the, we created uh, this uh, uh, Economic Transformation Program. We were only focused on 12, mm -hmm. 12 sectors that we thought would be the strength of Malaysia. Look at Korea. Their focus is only telecommunication and automobile. Samsung became world popular and Hyundai, the car, became world popular. Right. So you don't focus too many things. You focus, what's your strength? After that, you must have a very easy pathway for them to come and invest. The problem with many nations from the British Empire <laughs> or the British legacy is bureaucracy. So what the Prime Minister did then, Tun Mahade, and also the former Prime Ministers, is to have an economic council. Every Monday they meet. And whatever mega project comes, they, the, that, that uh, economic council meets and calls the respective ministry to facilitate that approval. They don't go through and uh, three months there, three months there, three months, they run away. Because they can't uh, absorb the cost of that planning for investment. Mm -hmm. They want quick, fast, and tax exemptions given. 10 years, pioneer status. They come, they're not taxed for 10 years. But they must, the, uh, must uh, give work for the locals, what technology they're bringing to the country, how resources are used here, not becoming a dumping ground, you know, all this. So the most important thing is getting approvals fast, facilitating them. And then the government created a uh, workforce for them. The government spent money to train people to be fitted into these industries. They had a separate training program called Talent Corp. Mm -hmm. Talent Corp. They call uh, uh, under the Prime Minister Department. A talent. A talent grooming institutions. Right. Where they bring people for the specific industry. Mm -hmm. They will groom them and, and give to them. So th the another problem is, is, I want to come and start this, but you know, I don't have the uh, manpower. And then again, immigration department. You must allow foreigners, certain number of people to come to transfer technology. And that must be within the mm -hmm. uh, contractual agreement with that company concern. That you must bring people and train our people, human resource development. So all this ecosystem must be created in a healthy manner for everybody to benefit, win-win situation. Right. So this, if you do this, you need a very clear planning mechanism, sit with the, some of the best brains, bring them together, I'm sure you can find a solution. Malaysia has encouraged the privatization of state-owned uh, enterprises. Um, in Sri Lanka, we have a massive uh, SOE burden on the taxpayer. <laughs> <laughs> Still a struggle, yeah, yeah. loss-making entities, um, and we see uh, corruption 
coming to light every day. Um, and there's also a question and uh, there's also reservations in terms of privatizing state-owned enterprises. What's the way forward? Yeah, Ratun Mahade in 1980 started uh, privatization and Malaysian Incorporated. Mm -hmm. The government sector and private sector worked together with one institution. And uh, the railways were privatized, postal service was privatized, airlines was privatized. So a lot of institutes which was actually bleeding were privatized. So privatization brings efficiency. Privatization brings a different out-of-box thinking on investment because land base was very strong. Rail base used to have a lot of land, but how do you monetize land? You give for development and from there keep money. Malaysian airports, for example, uh, KLIA, they call it, Kuala Lumpur International Airport, was built in a 25,000 acre land, mm -hmm. which was a, a estate before, Palm Oil Estate. It was taken over. Why I asked uh, Tun Mahathir, I had an opportunity to ask him in one of the opening ceremonies when he was retired. So he told me, if the airport is not doing well in the early uh, age, the, uh, the infant age, this palm oil estate's money will be used to mitigate loss. Mm. You know, the, because that, 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 that uh, ash strip and all that only needs about 20, probably about uh, 500 acres. The ULF, another maybe 20,000 acres to replenish funding. And from there they develop and reinvest some other things to bring ex in income. So it becomes a business entity. It doesn't become a service entity. Okay, then the problem is the poor cannot uh, will suffer because the, the charges will be high, the tickets will be priced higher than what the government did. They gave coupons, mm -hmm. they gave cards where the B40 group will be subsidized, uh, where they have to pay a minimal amount to travel and the rich have to pay. So you actually uh, uh, tax in a different way, in a more need base, uh, not uh, across the board. Right. So it helps, you see. So policies have to be reformed and uh, new thinking can come in and new dynamism will come in, in efficiency, in, in fiscal savings. This is how the privatization helped. And that company eventually, some of it also suffered. Mm -hmm. But some of them, uh, some good leadership within the corporate organization, which was privatized, became rich. <laughs> and they modernized their services. Now they've got 12 track, 12 track, last time one track railway, now got two. So now talking about speed trains. And people are traveling 200 kilometers to come to work and go back every day. That should be the eventuality if you want to stop the jams of Colombo, the, the traffic flow of Colombo, vehicles are growing, homes having two, three cars. So public transportation has to be modernized. Mm -hmm. So this could be done if railways is prioritized. They can look for other source of income through their land base, through the other services they can provide. And that's what we can learn from Malaysia and 100%. that's how Malaysia Definitely. developed. Thank you very much, Dr. Devamani, for your time here. Um, very brief visit in Sri Lanka, but you have had time to uh, visit us here at Hyde Park yeah, and yeah. to share your expertise. I want to come back again to Sri Lanka. We'll look it's forward to having country. you here. I'm falling in love with it. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much for this uh, little sub interview, you know. Yes. Uh, all the best for 2020 for the, for the citizens of Sri Lanka. God bless you all. Thank you. All the very best and thank you to Malaysia and yourself for your presence here at Hyde Park. We had with us Dr. S.K. Devamani, the former Deputy Minister to the former Prime Minister of Malaysia, a former Speaker, a former Member of Parliament, a Senator, and of course um, the initiator of a transformational economic program of Malaysia, joining us here at Hyde Park. Good night.